We're ready? And we have another, we got another video, another story today on what might have happened on that day when Jesus was born. Hudson, would you grab the lights for me, please? Go ahead, D. Well, the Bible doesn't. Uh, the Bible doesn't record a innkeeper's son per se, but Luke chapter two speaks to this scene that we just saw there. Luke chapter two, verses one to seven, right where you have your finger, right now. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. 
And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in the manger because there was no place for them at the inn. This is the Word of God. These are the first moments anybody on earth witnessed His Majesty as His unique arrival took place. As with a lot of the Christmas story, the details are pretty scant. We don't know a lot of the details. And while we know the big picture, we we can use our imagination to, to consider what else might have happened on that first Christmas night. See, it's not out of the realm of possibility that somebody could have been there to help the holy couple in the way that was described. To help make their night more comfortable and And we don't know for sure whether an actual innkeeper showed up on time and provided in the way the innkeeper's son suggested he did. But God has a way of putting people in our paths at just the right time. Just the right way. We've all had these experiences, haven't we? But just the right time and just the right way, somebody comes into your life. we can chalk it up to coincidence or maybe we can see God's hand in all things and and on some level we can say what would we rather believe would we rather believe that it's just just dumb luck just coincidence just a random chance or would we rather believe that there's a sovereign God who cares about you enough to bring that person into your life just at that time when you needed them Some people may want it to be luck. May want it to be random chance. They don't want a sovereign God. That's my throne. They might think, I am sovereign. I'm in control. I want to be in control. That's that's good for a while, right? Until the world shows you you're not in control. And I think this is one of the things about COVID that scared people so much was the loss of control, the lack of control. All of a sudden, all these things out of our control. And so what did we see happening? We saw a huge exertion of control. Try to get things back under control. Right? And and it doesn't matter what side you're on with, with all the COVID stuff, but one of the things that we saw any and all authorities in a way were trying to rectify that feeling of a loss of control. To try to put things back in order. To try to, try to fix the chaos that was going on in the world. And I think this is also why we saw so many people maybe act in ways that weren't normal for them. Because we feel the same way. We don't like not having control. We don't like being out of control. But see, when we trust God, we don't don't need to slide into that. We don't need to step into that because we know that God is in control. We know that He's working, that whatever comes, He's going to use it for His kingdom and for His glory in some way, even when we can't understand or grasp how this could ever be. And this is a big piece of living a life of peace. See what I did there? What we call it? A, what, it what's, what is it? When two words, when they, when they say the same but they're spelled different, they mean something different. What's, what's it called? Where's, where's our teachers? What's it called? An an, no, an antonym is, is the opposite, right? What is it, homonym? Synonym? Means the same thing? I don't know. Cinnamon. 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 Wow. Well. Man, you guys are getting all the grammar lessons. You get the lesson about the exclamation point. You're learning about synonyms and homonyms and antonyms. It's a good morning. But it's a big piece of, of, of living a life of peace is trusting that God is in control. Um, last week, um, on Monday, I went to Revelstoke. I had to go to Revelstoke for an appointment. And it was a really windy day on Revelstoke. And I'm going across the ferry on a really windy day. And a ferry ridden on the ferry going to Revelstoke on a really windy day. Yeah, not fun, Right? Not fun. Actually, Dee and I were on the ferry a while ago at night on a really windy day. We got yelled at by the captain. That was scary, right? Because we, we had our light on. And she had told everybody to turn off the lights. And then, like, we opened the door and our cargo light went on. And there's no way to turn it off, right? You just got to wait. And she yells down, you know, white truck, turn off your cargo light. 
We're like, yeah, all right, we're doing our best. But anyway, we're on the ferry. It's windy on the ferry. And so the ferry is rocking and rolling. And I'm starting to feel a little anxious. I'm starting to feel a little worked up. So this is, this is uh, like Monday afternoon. I've been working on the sermon all Monday morning about peace and about trusting God and having peace in your life to trust God. And I'm starting to feel a little anxious about the ferry, the waves in the ferry. And all of a sudden I think like, wait a minute, I'm going to stand up here on Sunday and tell people that they need to trust God in order to have peace in their life. And I'm on the ferry worrying about some waves. And I had to check myself. And it's not about me being a hero, but I had, to, I had to stop myself and I had to pray. And God brought peace. Reminded me that He's in control. And it's hard. There's things we're afraid of. There's things we're scared of. Right? But on some level, we really have to believe what we say we believe. We really have to believe what we really believe and, and say, you know, I, I trust God no matter what. Yeah, I don't want that thing to happen. But if it does, I need to trust that God is in control. And He knows best. And He knows what He's doing. See, because it's not just enough to confess that we believe God is in control. It's not just enough for me to come and stand up here on a Sunday and say, you know, God is in control so you can have peace. Meanwhile, throughout the week, I'm freaking out because the ferry is moving around a little bit. Right? It's not just enough to confess that we believe God is in control. It's not just enough to tell it. But when we actually believe something, you show it in your actions. When our faith is both demonstrated and proclaimed, something powerful takes place. James, uh, Jesus' brother, is writing several decades after Jesus is born in the manger. And, and he, he talks about this. He goes on to write a letter to encourage Christians about demonstrating their faith in ways that are pleasing to God. So in James chapter 2, verses 14 and 19, it says this, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of them says to you, says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So what James writes in this part of his letter is, is the idea um, that speaks to the actions. What James writes in this part of the letter speaks to kind of the video that we saw, but the actions that the innkeeper's son said that his dad did. Right on the night that Jesus was born, what, that his father did what he could do to be helpful to Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus in a way that made a lasting impact on this 14-year-old boy. I mean, a fictional lasting impact on a fictional 14-year-old boy. But, you know, we get the point. We never know how small acts of kindness that stem from our faith can impact others and bless God in the process. Right? We talked about this last week, how our actions ripple out into the world throughout generations. We never know where those ripples are going to hit or where they're going to go. See, but James is writing this because he's deeply troubled by an attitude. And the attitude that James is writing to, to deal with is this attitude towards faith that sees it only as a verbal confession. Such as a confession that God is one. Right? You notice that in verse 19. He says, you believe that God is one. You do well. Good job. You know, he commends his Jewish Christian readers for believing there's one God. He says, you believe one God? That's good. That's actually that's great. You're doing really good on that front. Right now, every Jewish person would, would, would affirm that. It's a tenet of Jewish orthodoxy. It's a tenet, a tenet of Christian orthodoxy as well. But what James is saying, such an acceptance of a creed is not enough. It's not enough. But every Jew would say the Lord is one. Every Jew is telling part of their faith. But, but true faith isn't only about telling people what you believe. Because there's a showing that's meant to go with the telling. Right? One of the best days in school is show and tell. Right? Especially when you're little. One of the best days is show and tell. You call it, what do you call it now? Sharing? Like boys sharing, girls sharing, right? Different people sharing. Right? Um, but one of, the best, one of the best days is show and tell. 
right? Isabella, have you got to do show and tell yet at school? You don't do show and tell? Gabriella, you've done show and tell, right? Yes, you have. Thumbs up. I see you back there. Some of the best memories of early childhood, you get to show somebody. And usually it's something you've already told your friends about, right? Right? You've told your friends, I got this really, really cool thing. I got this cool toy. I got this cool shirt. I got this amazing hat. I got this. Now I want to show you. So you've told your friends about it already. You've told them out in the playground. It's amazing. And now I'm so excited. I get to bring it to you and I get to show you so you can see it. James says in this part of the letter that faith isn't just meant to be told, but it's meant to be shown. It's meant to be a show and tell faith. Right? Not one or the other. Not just tell. Not just show. Show and tell. A show and tell faith. James is saying if all you're doing is telling people, I believe that God is one, yeah, you're telling the truth, but if there's nothing coming out of your life which backs that up, nothing coming out of your life which supports that, then your faith is just an echo chamber of what somebody else has said. You're just repeating what somebody else has told you. It's got no real bearing on your life until you back it up with action. Until you back it up with what you're doing. See, because James says, I'm glad you believe the Lord our God is one. That's a good thing. But even the demons believe that. The demons believe that and they shudder. Why are they shuddering? Because sure, yeah, they believe that the Lord is one, but they don't have saving faith in Him. Right? They respect His power. They know their faith, but they hate Him. Right? So there's a place where you could say, where somebody could say, I believe the Lord is one, but live a life against Him. That's exactly what the demons do. This is what James is saying. He says, how is your belief any different from the demons' belief? If all your faith consists of is telling me you have a belief, then maybe you're no different from the demons because they say they believe it too. And so James goes on to talk about how our faith is not a, a tell-only faith or a show-only faith. But you're meant to show and tell. A faith that only tells but does not have anything to show for it does not even have the power to save you. This is what James suggests. But the faith that James is talking about, this real faith, authentic faith, genuine faith, is always going to have works to accompany it. The person is going to have something to show for it, like the innkeeper did when he said to have brought towels and water to help bring comfort to the holy couple. If that indeed did happen, then the, il the innkeeper is illustrating what James is talking about. The very nature of faith is meant to be a show and tell faith. And the reason why James is taking this stance, the reason why he's, he's poking at this thing, is because he's, he's, he's pushing back against false teachers in his day, which were setting forth an incorrect view of faith. And they were setting forth this faith saying, as long as you believe. It doesn't matter what you do, as long as you believe. If you believe, that's enough. As long as you believe. And James is saying, wrong! Wrong! What you do reveals who you are. What you do reveals what you believe. If you say you believe this, but then you live out something different, then maybe you don't believe it. If you live something totally contradictory to what you believe, if your lips and your life do not match up, then you need to take a step back and evaluate the authenticity of your faith. There's a saying that goes, when someone shows you who you are, who they are, when someone shows you who they are, you should listen to them. And the whole point of that is, someone can tell you who they are. They can tell you who they are. But when they show you who they are, you should really listen to them. Because they're showing you who they really are. Some people might say, yeah, but I prayed a prayer and asked Jesus to be my Lord when I was a kid. I went to Sunday school. I went through catechism. I went through confirmation. I got baptized at youth camp. To which I would say, awesome. That's great. Like seriously, that's, that's great. I love that. But if you tell me that and then I look at the landscape of your life and there's no evidence at all of your faith, 
No fruit of faith coming out of your life. Nothing else besides you telling me that you're a follower of Jesus that shows what you actually are. That should cause both of us to pause and evaluate the authenticity of your faith. You might think, well, no one really says that, do they? Right here we are in church. We're all in church here. No one really says that. They do. I've had it said to me. I've had it said to me a number of times. You know when it's said to me the most often? It's almost never said to me by the person. It's almost always said to me by somebody else talking about that person. And you know when it's said to me? When I'm sitting with them planning the funeral. That's when I hear it. Almost every time. When I'm sitting with them planning the funeral. And I ask about their faith. I ask about what this person believed. I ask about their life. Where were they? And they'll say, well, I don't know where they were, but I know they went to Sunday school when they were a kid. I don't know what they would say, but I knew they grew up this way. I think it was Charles Spurgeon that once said that one of the devil's tricks was to convince us that we have a lot more time to think about our eternity. But friends, this isn't the case. It's not the case. Right? It's always, I'll think about that when I'm older. I'll think about that when I'm retired and have a lot of time. Then I'll look into the Bible. Well, I'll think about that when the kids move out. Well, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll have time to think about that when I'm, you know, when I'm older, when I'm in college, when, I'm, when I move out of my parents' house. Then I'll have time to actually think about my faith. Right now, I'm just in, you know, I'm in grade three, I'm in grade five, I'm in grade seven. I don't have to worry about that stuff yet. I'm going to live forever. And yet, we're not guaranteed any days. And so even the kids that are here, right, one of the devil's tricks convince us that we've got all the time in the world to think about this stuff. We've got all the time in the world to think about our eternal soul. But we don't. Advent is a good time to evaluate our faith. Advent is a good time to decide and to look at our life and see where we're at. Right, you could be in elementary school, you could be in high school. You know, don't fall into the trap. I'll think about that when I'm at college. I'll think about that when I'm an adult. I'll think about that when I'm a senior. I'll think about that later. Think about it now. You know how hard it is to sit at that table planning a funeral with a family and to have them say, I don't know what she believed, but I know she went to church as a kid. Because I know what they want me to do. I know exactly what they want me to do. They want me to tell them that their loved one is in heaven with God. That's what they want me to do because they want comfort. It's normal, right? It's not weird. It's not strange. It's not duplicitous or anything like that. They want comfort. They want peace. And what they're feeling is a ton of chaos because they don't know. Well, I love doing funerals like that because it gives me an opportunity to speak into people's lives. I also hate doing funerals like that. Right? Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Jesus speaks about people with authentic faith who are true followers and believers who would walk with Him every day, who had a show and tell faith. Notice it goes far beyond a prayer. Lord, Lord. But it moves toward a life that is demonstrating a faith. It's a show and tell faith. And as we, as we talk about and reflect on the peace we have with God, 
and the peace we have in this world, does our show match our tell? Right, because it's not just about you know, telling you that I believe in Jesus, that I'm saved, and I'm a Christian, I'm showing you that by my actions. But it's also about, I'm telling you that I have peace with God. I was in a car yesterday driving back from Vancouver, and uh, the, pe- the other people in the car started asking me about how I became a pastor and, and, and things like that, which was like, yes, right, I've been waiting and praying for this, this time, right? We're driving together four hours there, four hours back, and praying that they would ask me, and finally they asked me, I'm like, yeah, yeah, you like, buckle in, here we go. And so, right, so I start going into my testimony and start talking about this, and I, you know, I tell them about the peace that I have with God. And I've got to answer this question myself, does my show match my tell? Does my life actually exhibit peace? Do I have peace in my heart? Do I have peace in my mind? Or, or is my life full of chaos? Is it all over the place? And absolutely chaotic? Right, I can sit in that car and I can tell people I have peace. I got peace in my heart. I got peace in my mind. I got peace with the Lord. And they might be thinking there, man, you don't. You're all over the map. You are the most chaotic person I've ever met in my life, and you're telling me you got peace with God? And you have peace? What are they going to think? What are they going to believe? Are they going to believe what I tell them? Or are they going to believe what I show them? You know the answer to that. They're going to believe what I show them. Do we have peace in our lives? We say we have peace in God. We actually have peace. Or is our life... Is our life constantly creating and inviting chaos? Are we constantly in crisis? I'm not saying we don't all have things that happen. We have things that happen. Crisis comes. You don't have control over that. You don't have control over things that happen. Loved ones get sick. Worse things happen than that. Crisis comes. When things go off the rails which they do in life because we live in a cursed world by sin. When things go off the rails, how do you respond? Does your show match your tell? When you show up for the family get-together, the Christmas family get-together, when you come through the door, do you bring peace with you? Or when you come through the door, does everybody go... Here we go. Right? Does your show match your tell? We don't know. We'll never know if there was an innkeeper, an innkeeper's son who really did play that role, who really brought water, who really brought towels. We'll never know. Right? These are simply conjecture and and being curiously imaginative, right? about what happened, of stuff not specifically recorded in the Bible. But what is clear in the Bible is that Jesus came to his people. He came to us. He came to his creation to rescue us from our sin, to rescue us from separation from a holy God, to reconcile us to God so that we could have peace. So we could have peace in our hearts and peace in our minds and peace in our lives. So we could be peacemakers, not just peacekeepers, but peacemakers, that we would actively create peace in our lives and in the lives of others. And what does that look like? Like, what does that actually do? I was at a conference this week, and uh, I'm going to wrap up here right away, but I was at a conference this week, and uh, it was a school trustees conference down in Vancouver, and we talked about pedagogy, which is a big word, and I'm using it to impress you. Um, But it basically means teaching. Pedagogy basically means teaching. And they talked about this, but it was like 10,000 feet in the air. Right? It was so high up in theory that it was almost useless down on the ground. Right? It's like you need to do this, you need to be like this, and this is how you should do it. And they were all good things, they were all right things, but it's like, okay, but how do I do that? What does that actually look like? I could say you need to have peace with God because you have peace with God through Christ. You need to have a life of peace. And you might be thinking, yeah, but how do I do that? Like, what does that look like when I get up on Monday morning and get the phone call that things have gone off the rails? 
What do I actually do? And the answer, one of the reasons why you get all this theory in these things is the answer is, I don't know. Because every situation is so different. And I can't tell you how to react to this phone call or that phone call or this phone call. And the Bible doesn't tell you specifically either. Right? If you get a phone call tomorrow morning and it's somebody saying, you know, crashed my car, it's down the hill of the Monashi, what are we going to do? You could open the Bible and be like, you know, where's the tow company's phone number? Like, you know, it's not in there. What it tells us is we're to still have peace. Now, how do we do that? Because we believe what we believe. God has this under control. And we're going to deal with it. And we're going to take one step at a time. And we're just going to deal with it. Right? And we're going to bring peace to the situation. Somebody's going to phone you in crisis. You're going to have a crisis. I'm going to tell you, you're going to have a crisis this Christmas season. Maybe you've already had it. You're going to have a crisis, and somebody's going to call you, and somebody's going to talk to you. And are you going to bring peace? Peace. Be still. We'll deal with this together. We'll do this together. Right? Because we're going to believe what we believe. We're going to show what we tell. Because God has brought us peace. And our lives are going to show that peace. May we all be intentional, though. Intentionable. <laughs> May we all be intentional about living lives that show and tell. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite you to the table of the Lord here this morning. You can turn that off, Hudson. Thank you.